So um, without delay, I'm going to let Ryan take over for the next couple hours. Thank you. Yeah. All right. It was a good introduction. Um, so this screen is for your benefit. Uh, as Deborah was saying, Kinesis uh, is primarily an external uh, kind of study. But there is a lot of things that you can learn from it that you can apply elsewhere. And that's really why I developed this, this program. The idea is that when we have a good understanding of our bodies, how we move effectively, and understand our individual selves better, we're able to uh, apply that to our training in all other aspects of our life. When I first started uh, learning kinesiology, I was amazed at the information that was available and uh, how interesting it was. I, I love the topic, for one. But uh, I was also amazed at how isolated the knowledge was. Uh, there's so many different movement art forms throughout dance, throughout martial arts, and other forms uh, that lack this kind of information. So I wanted to see about making it more available so that we can have better uh, practices and better training in our different movement arts. Uh, primarily, this was originally set up for martial arts. Uh, I noticed that um, there is so much tradition based in the martial arts. Um, and a lot of them have become more cookie cutter. You know, they teach, uh, they teach students one way, and they teach every student the same way how the teacher was trained. But that's not necessarily going to work for every student. Um, and so you find in, a diff in many different martial arts clubs, the ones who are most successful tend to look more like their instructor because they have similar body types or they have similar abilities. Um, and so they, they find success and joy in the training that they get from, uh, from that style with that instructor. I think Deborah would work with you. Sure he would. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> body type. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what we want to do is, is learn how many different kinds of people with different abilities uh, are able to train and develop so that teachers are more effective they have um, more success with greater numbers of students. Uh, the main aspects of studying kinesiology include uh, giving teachers new vocabulary to use while teaching students. And also students, the greater ability to learn from their instructor and from themselves. Teachers will be able to uh, identify certain characteristics of one student versus another and train them differently and effectively. And a student will stop looking at other students, their peers, and comparing themselves to each other. And saying, oh, I'll never be as good as you know, Josh or Deborah. You know, I'll never be as, uh, as effective as them. Why, are they, why does it some, come so easily to them, but not to me? Well, maybe I just have a different ability. Right? I have my own strengths and weaknesses. And with this study also, teachers will be able to uh, gain a better understanding of how to um, increase a student's uh, natural strengths and minimize their weaknesses. So with that, we're going to get started. Kinesiology can serve as an essential support by providing the intellectual tools for accurate structural analysis and for the design of efficient and effective conditioning programs. Sally Fit. Why do we study kinesiology? Because it helps us understand movement and our own bodies. It helps us learn to love our own uniqueness and aids us in injury prevention and treatment. It helps us condition more effectively, self-educate, and learn what's right for us. Kinesiology is the study of human body kinetics, or movement. Where does movement come from in our brains? Movement, balance, and coordination are located in three general regions of the central nervous system, the motor cortex and premotor areas, the cerebellum, and basal ganglia. The cerebellum is our primary focus, however, and it sits in the lower back of the skull, in the posterior cranial fossa, and is attached to the brain stem. The right and left hemispheres of the cerebellum work with its corresponding side of the spinal cord, but with the opposite hemisphere of the motor cortex. Problems with the cerebellum are often apparent in posture and walking gait. The fissures of the cerebellum are deeper than the fissures of the brain, making its surface area very significant. The cut surface of the cerebellum is called the vermis, but is also known as the arbor vitae, meaning tree of life, 
since it has a look similar to the branches of a tree. Okay, terminology, quick overview here. Ossification refers to the hardening of bone. Articulation is two points where bones join to make a joint. Proximal refers to closest to the center of body, and distal, further away from center. Superficial is the muscle layer closest to the skin, where deep refers to muscle closest to bone. Flexion is a decreasing angle between levers. Extension is an increasing of angles between two levers. Hyperextension is an increasing of angles between two levers beyond 180 degrees. Abduction is a movement away from the midline of the body, and adduction is movement towards the midline of the body. Inward rotation has the limbs move towards front, and outward rotation limbs move away from front of the body. There are four types of restrictions to movement. We have the bone, skeletal system, muscle. It's a great anatomy picture, isn't it? Let me take that away. Ligaments. In this picture, I've got a foot uh, with a bunch of wires in between. Those were to represent the different ligaments that are in there. And then the shape of the joint. And this is one of the things that's, that we're going to talk about pretty extensively is the shape that your joints make and the, that your bones make. Uh, anatomical variations are very common in all of us. Uh, and they're just, um, they're just that. They're variations. <laughs> they're about, <laughs> you're curious about that, huh? <laughs> so let's try uh, something else here. So in 1954, published in the Atlas of Man, W.H. Sheldon proposed somatotyping with three primary body types based on what he saw as the predominant body tissue, the ectomorph, mesomorph, and endomorph. Sheldon observed that the ecto has a predominance of nerve tissue, the meso has a predominance of connective and muscle tissue, and the endo has a predominance of endocrine tissues. Any questions about those? Okay. What do you mean by predominance? Predominance. Like, um, mostly nerve tissue? Well, that's a, that's a good question because, right, not the whole body. I mean, when you look at all of the different elements of the body, it's not going to be a predominance of all of those things, but more so than other people. So if we take these three things, muscle, nerve, and endocrine tissues, um, comparative to uh, the other types, uh, they're going to have a, a more than the others. For so relative to each other, there's more. Okay. In endocrine tissue, you mean like glands? Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Yes. So glands, regulatory like systems, and fat. What's that? Like if a person has more nervous tissue, what might that translate to as a life experience? Well, that's a really good question. That's what we're going to get into right now. So there's a breakdown for each of these. Um, each of them has its own strengths and weaknesses, and no one person is one or another exclusively. You tend to have um, uh, elements of each. So let's look at these individually. The ectomorph has a variety of potential strengths and weaknesses. In general, the strengths include having greater mobility and flexibility. The ecto also has a highly efficient nervous system. An ecto is also able to move quicker and more suddenly, likely a result of the nerve system development, aiding in fast twitch muscle reflexes. This also leads to the potential for more finely tuned senses than the other body types. On the downside, however, the ectomorph tends to have less dense bone tissue, and the long bones of the body are longer than other types. This is often demonstrated by a positive ape index, where the length of the arms is greater than the length of the body from head to foot. The ectomorph tends to mature later in life and may have a hard time keeping up with peer groups who may be mentally and physically more developed. Posture is often an issue with the ecto because the ligaments and other joint connective tissues are loosely strung together and the muscular system is less efficient. The ecto's blood pressure tends to be low and may have a hard time regulating body temperature. There are several reasons for this. Part of this may be connected to the less efficient muscular system. The heart is your hardest working muscle, but for the ectomorph, the heart may be weaker. The vascular system requires flexibility, but the ecto's 
vasodilation and vasoconstriction are slower to react to changes in physical demand. On top of all this, the ecto may be more sensitive to pain and other external stimuli. This is one of the downsides to having a highly efficient nervous system. You feel more and sense more, which can overwhelm the body and result in higher levels of neuromuscular tension. If that weren't enough, the ectomorph also must deal with a less efficient digestive system, meaning the ecto has a harder time absorbing nutrients, making him susceptible to hypoglycemia, anemia, and low levels of adrenaline. In part because of the higher sensitivity to external stimuli, the ecto may have a harder time falling asleep and staying asleep through the night. Now let's consider the mesomorph. There are many details of note for this body type. The strengths include many aesthetic elements, such as a solid, square, muscular, and athletic appearance. The shoulders are wider than the hips, and they mature fairly early in life. Because the meso has a well-developed muscular and cardiovascular system, they tend to excel at sports from an early age and have an average to low blood pressure and low heart rate when active. It goes without saying, the meso's vascular constriction and dilation adapt rapidly to changing demands. Aiding the mesomorph in physical activity is the well-adapted connective tissues of the joints, which are tightly strung together, adding stability and control to movement. They also have higher levels of adrenaline, for more energy, and have a good digestive tract, allowing for large amounts of food consumption when active, without gaining weight. With a highly efficient muscular system and strong tightly bound joints, it is no wonder this body type has the best posture of the three. But the mesomorph also has many potential weaknesses. This body is built for activity. When a mesomorph becomes sedentary, they run the risk of developing hypertensive heart disease, especially later in life. They must cut back on caloric intake as well, as this can easily lead to a buildup of visceral fat or fat cells around the midsection. This has been linked to diabetes. Additionally, because the mesomorph has tight ligaments and thicker connective tissues, they have a hard time retaining flexibility. The stability these tissues provide can also lead to muscular imbalances and strain on supporting elements of the skeletal system. In the case of injuries such as sprains and strains, the inflexibility of tissue means these injuries can be severe. Now we have the endomorph. Much like the mesomorph, the endomorph shares a natural potential for strength and endurance but keeps much of the flexibility that the ectomorph enjoys. One of the more adaptable features of this body type is the ability to shift rapidly from one energy to another. They are able to become active and find energy quickly, having more adrenaline than the ectomorph, but then relax completely in the next moment. Endomorphs are very sound sleepers and can fall asleep very easily. This may be in part because of the well-balanced hormonal release stemming from a highly efficient endocrine system. The endomorph is the least sensitive to pain and other stimuli of the three body types, and so long as weight is maintained, they are able to keep a low heart rate and blood pressure. The endomorph in many ways has a good balance between the ecto and mesomorphic body types, sharing many of the strengths of the two and not many of their weaknesses. But the endo does have several weaknesses that can become serious. The endomorph has a highly efficient digestive system and absorbs nutrients very well, but this often results in storing excessive amounts of energy in the form of fat cells. The endo must maintain a strict diet in order to maintain weight as a result. A low metabolism and tendency towards low thyroid levels and obesity are common issues with this body type. The endomorph also tends to be shorter or more stocky than the other two and have shorter long bones of the body giving a negative ape index. All other diseases associated with obesity are common for the endomorph. It's important to remember that there is no one true type that describes any one perfectly. We share elements of each, with one type being more primary to our bodies, with a few tendencies towards a secondary. But what does any of this information actually do for us? How do we apply any of it to our practice? Well. The aid comes from understanding the implications of the details as well as some of the psychology behind the different types. If you had a class made up of equal parts of each body, you might likely see the ectomorph off in one corner stretching, the mesomorphs 
would be out in the center of activity doing some kind of endurance training or strength-based exercise, and the endomorphs would be mingling amongst the two groups without much clear direction or goal in mind, just sampling from the methods employed by their counterparts. We all tend to place more focus into the things we are already good at, or have a natural ability to perform in when it comes to our training, but this is counterproductive to our overall well-being. By nature, training in any discipline should emphasize a balance designed to minimize weaknesses and maximize potential. The yellow ligaments and loosely strung together elements of the ectomorph make her already quite flexible. Less time should be spent on stretching and more time spent on endurance and muscular developing exercises, as well as proper nutrition guidance with complex carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, and other essential minerals and nutrients. The mesomorph, likewise, is already adept at endurance and strength building. To add balance to her training, more stretching and self-care are needed. The mesomorph needs to be educated on the limits of their body and understand the psychology of injuries and when they are most likely to occur, a topic I will address later in another episode. The endomorph needs a good coach who can offer focused training aimed at the needs of the individual. Weightlifting to build muscle, as well as plenty of endurance exercises, are needed to help her maintain a healthy lifestyle, as well as education on proper nutrition, low and simple carbohydrates and saturated fats, but high in nutrient and vitamin-rich foods and dark leafy greens, healthy fats and oils such as olive, coconut, and avocado. The endomorph needs to be reassured that when they begin their training, it is normal to see some initial gains in weight as the body takes on more muscle, which is heavier than fat. They may need help to not get discouraged by such gains, as it will later help in shrinking fat cells because of the extra energy required by the new muscle growth. While good nutrition is of course essential for anyone regardless of body type, the ecto and endo may require the most coaching in this area to meet their goals. There are many additional implications we can derive from understanding these body types and how they impact a person's training and psychology. As a matter of my personal speculation, we might for example consider how the hypersensitive nature of the ectomorph might create a personality that is more cautious and reserved, even closed off at times, but hyperactive at others. We might also consider the endomorph as having a greater potential for low self-confidence and depression, and the mesomorph's tendencies towards overconfidence leading to early injuries that they battle with for life. But as I said, these are just speculations. Perhaps you can identify other tendencies that may be derived from understanding somatotypes. Take some time with this end of section lab to identify your own tendencies between these three body types and have fun with it. Hello all my friends out there. I hope you got a lot out of this video. A lot of time and effort goes into making these, so I hope you'll support us by liking and subscribing to the channel and supporting us on Patreon. There are several more videos just like this on its way, so keep a lookout. In our next section, we'll be covering the foot and knee joints, and hopefully I'll have it done just in time for finals, so you can use this as a study guide. In the meantime, keep learning and keep training.